Make nothing up. So most importantly, I want you to know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Why are we looking up to heaven? Christ has come. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. 
Why are we looking ahead to the future? Why are we afraid of death and dying? God's love casts out fear. Why are we afraid to follow Jesus? In Christ we have the promise of a new life and eternal life to come. In Christ we join our hearts to worship God. We bring a prayer to the rest and enter the reign of God. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together. Christ whose glory fills the skies to number 173.
You may remain seated as we sing together hymn number 159, Lift High the Cross. Scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus, about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convicting proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, 
Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we hear the story of Jesus' ascension back into heaven. And following this ascension, the disciples return to the upper room in Jerusalem to discern what they are to do next. They had become accustomed to having Jesus back after his death and resurrection. So they felt a large absence following his ascension after they had reconvened in Jerusalem, which comes after where our text ended today. What are they to do next? How are they to face the uncertainty they may have felt following Jesus' ascension? Where do we turn in the face of uncertainty? In times of great change and uncertainty, we search for the familiar. We search for places of comfort. We search for places where we feel emotionally and spiritually and physically safe. We search for some form of stability in the midst of chaos. The disciples turn to community and prayer following Jesus' ascension. Through this community and prayer, they begin to discern what they are to do next. Where do we turn in times of uncertainty? Often enough, it is similar to what this first congregation described in Acts does. We gather for prayer and community. John Wesley, as you may well know, was the founder of the United Methodist Church. And he spent about two years here in America. Following Wesley's time there, here, Methodism began to grow. And Wesley sent Francis Asbury to America towards the end of the 1700s. Francis Asbury is now known as the father of American Methodism. Asbury had worked with Wesley in England and wanted to do his best to uphold Wesley's values and traditions. However, it was difficult at times because there was slow communication between England and America at the time. They didn't quite have email yet. Wesley would write sermons and letters to send for the, as a basis for theology and practice and structure, but they would take weeks to get there, which caused the leaders of American Methodism to make some decisions for themselves, which sometimes contradicted what Wesley wanted. Asbury would do the best he could and would continuously discern the, the direction the church should be on. The discernment process is never one that is necessarily easy. We're currently living in a time where the discernment process about what to do next changes almost daily. And when we're living in uncertainty and are struggling with what comes next, the church is often a place for comfort and guidance. In the midst of my own personal anxiety and uncertainty about the future, I know that my confidence in God has provided me with a deep comfort that is almost unable to be described. My first year of seminary, I needed a recommendation from my advisor. As I was starting the candidacy process, which started the long road I have been on to get to the point where I'll be ordained in a few weeks. 
The recommendation was for a psychological evaluation. And he asked me the question, should I tell them that anyone as bright as you is crazy to consider ordination when the UNC is in chaos? Or shall I just focus on your mental health and character? I told him that focusing on my mental health and character would probably be more than enough. But I continued to dwell on his question. Why was I considering ordination in a church that was and is still in such turmoil? Where do I go when the church splits? What will my place in the church be? Seminary was a time when I had a lot more questions than I had answers. And I fully expected seminary to provide me with so many answers. And today, I still find myself asking similar questions. But I also ask myself questions like, how do I lead a congregation when everything still feels so different than it did three years ago? How do we continue to be the church when we see the pain and violence and destruction happening around us? What is the role of the church in responding to all of the uncertainty happening around us? It seems that more often than not, I have more questions than answers. I'm sure that John Wesley and Francis Asbury had more questions than answers at times. I'm sure that this first congregation in Acts following the ascension had more questions than answers. They sort of lucked out, though, because they could actually use the Sunday school answer of Jesus for some of their questions. And I'm sure it was the most helpful answer because Jesus was always so clear about what he said which is why we are still studying his words, trying to understand them 2,000 years later. In the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie at World's End, Elizabeth Swan, William Turner, and Captain Barbosa are attempting to find Baby Jones' locker. They've assembled their crew and found a ship and have set off on their journey. Their journey takes them through frigid waters and all sorts of perils. And at one point, Elizabeth and William realize that they are barreling full speed towards a waterfall. A waterfall that they will inevitably go over, despite their attempts to rally the crew to get the ship to turn around and back to safety. As they continue to gain speed, Captain Barbosa looks at them and says, We're good and lost now. You have to be lost to find a place that can't be found, or else everyone would know where it is. The rest of the crew does begin frantically working to prevent the ship from going overboard, from going over the waterfall, but they're unsuccessful. Little did they know that they would, in fact, discover Davy's locker following what they thought was the end. Barbosa was confident that they were on the right path. I imagine the crew had a few more questions than answers as they were going over this waterfall. <coughs> When we are in the midst of having more questions than answers, oftentimes we end up feeling lost and barreling towards a waterfall. The disciples felt lost when Jesus was crucified, but then got to experience the joy that comes with the resurrection. And now Jesus has left them again with the promise that one day he will return. 
However, Jesus knew the greater plan that was unfolding. The disciples continue to ask Jesus up until his ascension when he will restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus continues to tell them that it is not time, not the time for them to know, but that it is now their task to spread the kingdom of God while they are on earth. And Jesus' absence, I'm sure the disciples in that first congregation felt good and lost. They were unable to see what was continuing to unfold. In the 1700s, letters back and forth between John Wesley and Francis Asbury show that at times they were each good and lost and trying to figure out what to do next. They were not sure that the church they were starting was going to last into the 21st century. Today, I'm sure that there are times when we feel good and lost. When we look at the world around us, when we look at the church around us, we aren't sure what's coming next. We don't know what the future will hold for us. But what we do know is that we are not alone in our uncertainty. We are not alone in our discernment. We are not alone when we are good and lost. Because in the depths of our uncertainty, we can be certain that through Jesus' ascension, God's kingdom is still among us. We can be certain that Jesus is still working through us. We can be certain that next week when we celebrate Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us. We can be certain that we will continue to live into what God has called us to do. And God has called us to be witnesses to all the ends of the earth, even when we have more questions than answers. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. Oh God, you are with us, pouring your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these our gifts, gifts that you have graciously given to us that we now humbly return to further your kingdom on earth. Bless them, multiply them, bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, our prayer list can be found on the back of the bulletin. We want to continue to keep the family of Ann Saxon in our prayers. And I have a thank you card from Dana and Brad Crow that I would like to read to you all now. Thank you to everyone that helped with the food after my mother's service, to all that provided the food and to the ladies that served it. Our family is deep, our family deeply appreciated it. To thank you for your kindness and sympathy at a time when it was deeply appreciated. We also want to remember the family of Pat Munger who passed away this week. This morning we also remember and pray for the lives of those who have given their lives in service to this country, as tomorrow is Memorial Day. Are there other joys and concerns we would like to lift up as a congregation this morning? This morning, I will be sharing a prayer for Memorial Day written by John Killinger in the book, God's People at Prayer. And so, let us pray. If we did not remember the past, O oh God, our lives would not be worth living. Forgive us for ever thinking that our times are the only ones that matter, or that what has gone before us is not worthy of recollection. All life is fluid, and one age flows into another. We are inseparably linked to all who have preceded us, and all who will come after us. And because most of human history has been marked by wars and conflicts of one kind or another, we praise you today for all those who have joined humanity's struggle on our behalf. Some are friends and relatives. Others are completely unknown to us except as ciphers and statistics but they are all important. Their blood has been spilled, their lives given, for us who are alive today. We remember before you, especially those who have been killed in recent combat, all the men and women who have died to protect our freedoms and the freedoms of others. We pray for their families, and what they have suffered. There will always be evil in the world, O oh God. Jesus said it would grow up like weeds in the grass and that it would be impossible to separate them. And as long as there is evil, there will be war and death and destruction. Teach us sensitivity for all the dead and for our own mortality. Help us to live as those who are indebted to others and as those who are going to die. Make us aware of the beauty and glory of life while we are able to enjoy it, of its sheer preciousness, and let us praise you for it. Reveal yourself to us in the thin life, line between life and death this world and the next. We pray for all who suffer the lingering effects of battle, the many men and women who carry fragments of steel in their bodies or walk with false limbs or exist from day to day with mental or physical discomfort caused by the many forms of warfare. Comfort them, dear God and give them peace in their hearts. Grant that all of us in the safety and comfort of the sanctuary may learn to pray daily for a world beyond the torment of war and battle, where the lion will lie down with the lamb, 
and the bear will eat straw with the ox. For yours is the kingdom of ultimate peace and love. And now, through Jesus' name, we pray together the prayer he first taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 302, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. We will do verses one, however many are on the screen. Six. <laughs>
here. <laughs> we are still in the Easter season. Christ may be ascended, but he is risen indeed. And while there are times when we feel good and lost, in those times we are not alone. And so go in peace today. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.